Hello students, this video is for property. In chapter 23, we cover this very old idea of law that is all about property ownership and perhaps new aspects of ownership. And specific, or specifically to start, it's important for you to recognize as you're reading that what you may recognize as um, ownership is, is only one part of what it at law is recognized as. In other words, legal scholars often call it or refer to property ownership or property as a bundle of rights. So like a bundle of twigs, if I hold a whole, all the bundle related to that thing, then I hold and control all of those rights. It might be giving it away to someone else. One of those twigs might uh, say on it, possession. I can live there myself if it's a house or a piece of property. So just recognize as you're reading that this idea of ownership may have some additional facets uh, now that we're talking about it in a legal context. So first on slide five, um, the personal property is defined there and what we're contrasting here with this definition first at the start for personal property, personal is movable and tangible like a ring, a car, a boat, in contrast to what's on slide uh, 14, real property. Now, real property is a, perhaps a phrase you have heard before, but it is weird and kind of different, but it refers to land, fixed property. Fixtures are related to real property, so like a, a bookcase that is um, custom built into the wall is a fixture and it's part of the real property. If a bookcase sits on its own and can be moved from room to room, that's movable, so it's personal property. In slide seven and eight, there are four categories that the textbook author uh, uses and describes. These are from case law that describe um, categories that we put objects or things into whenever the object has become separated from its owner. Now, I'm carefully not using the word lost because lost is one of these categories. And what, what these really signify is a different consequence or a different result in case law whenever uh, a case is being brought to court something has been separated from its original owner and has been recovered by another party that other party may go to court to claim ownership over this thing and that the court's decision as to whether the new person gets to keep it, it the property goes back to its original owner or an heir of the original owner depends upon the circumstances and that tells us those circumstances tell us into which of these four categories that that property falls into so these are uh, and this is in slide seven and eight these are lost um, or or so mislaid or lost or abandoned or treasure trove those are the categories that you want to make sure that you can understand not only identifying the differences in the categories but then what that result would be for each of those categories in slide nine um, I want to skip ahead to slide 20 because what's mentioned here is adverse possession and it's mentioned in slide nine sort of with a reference to personal property adverse possession of personal property which is it exists at law but in my practice, I never encountered it. But this idea of adverse possession also exists uh, with regard to real property. And that's why it appears again in the slide presentation on slide 20. So skip ahead to slide 20 and you'll see a list of three things. You'll see um, these are requirements. In order for someone, so briefly, what adverse possession is, is a claim of ownership over something you've never bought, paid for, uh, or been given. So it's an adverse claim. You have been possessing something. If it's a thing, then it's personal property. If it's a, a location, a shack or a, a fishing cottage, uh, then it's real property. But you've been possessing without permission from the owner for a specified a specific period of time. Each state has their own law, state law, uh, defining how much time has to pass in order for you to be able to claim ownership under adverse possession. 
and that varies from one state to the next. But the, these three listed things that are inside 20, these are what the person claiming ownership, they possessed it, if the Georgia statute, I'm just making it up, if it's seven years, if that person has been living in this abandoned house for seven years, they could go to court at the end of the seventh year and claim this is now my house under adverse possession. What they have to prove in court is these three things. First, they, that they have been open, notorious, and visible in their possession. So that if the owner ever bothered to come back and look at the abandoned property, they would see someone else living there and be able to kick them out. That's the idea. Uh, number two, exclusive and actual possession. So it's not that they knew about the place and they told all their friends and sometimes they would go for a weekend or visit. Nope, it's got to be that they have been using it themselves. Um, and then the third is continuous possession. This is not interpreted by courts to be like a radio contest where you've seen where, you know, put your hand on the car and the last one with their finger still on the car wins the car. It isn't that literal. Possession here must be continuous in the sense that since you discovered it, you have continued to possess it without any break. If you broke possession, stopped living there for a brief period, moved somewhere else, then that starts the clock over. So if it was a seven year clock in our example, we're using that clock would start again. Now let's go back, backward to slide 10. There's an important property law maxim. A maxim, remember, is a theme at law, so it's not a statute, it's not even um, a regulation created by a government agency. It, it, it's a, a theme that recurs, but what it is, the significant property law maxim that's in slide 10 is that a seller can only convey that which uh, uh, that over which they hold title or that which they have control or they can sell. So they imagine there's an old adage or an old example of um, I could sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. I could, and if you're smart enough to pay me for it, then that's a win for me. But I don't own the Brooklyn Bridge, so. Just because I say I can sell it to you and I accept money from you legally, that doesn't make <clears throat> you the owner of the Brooklyn Bridge because I never owned it in the first place. So I can't transfer title to you when I don't myself have that title to transfer. That's this maxim in slide 10. Moving on. In slide 11, bailment is this kind of weird word. You may not have heard the word bailment before, but I can guarantee that you have been exposed to a bailment relationship, even though you may not have called it that and you may not have recognized it as such. Bailment is simply temporary possession by someone other than the owner of an object. If I take my watch to the jeweler for repair, then that's a bailment. And, uh, I'm the bailor, I'm the owner of the object, and I temporarily put it into the possession of the bailey, the jeweler. The jeweler is required to take reasonable care to make sure that my watch isn't uh, broken or lost or um, stolen. They have to lock it up in a case, perhaps. That's a bailment relationship. Now, in slide 12, so bailment is in slide 11. You can skip slide 12 altogether. You will not be tested uh, in chapter 23 or on the final on um, leased objects under the UCC Article 2A. Um, in slide 14, slide 14 through 19, these are very important. In particular, slide 14 sets out the list. These are forms of ownership interests specific to real property. These are the types of ownership of real property, and you need to know each of these know what they are. They're described in slides that follow. So this is slides 14 through 19, um, starting with fee simple. Know that this list, though, starts with the strongest type of property ownership or the biggest, and then dwindles down to the smallest. So fee simple absolute means I can do whatever I want. The only limitation on what I can do with the property comes from the government in the form of zoning. If the government has zoned it a commercial area, then I can't live and make my residence in that area because the government has said so. Otherwise, there's not anyone else who holds one of the twigs. I hold them all if I hold the property and own it in fee simple absolute. Moving all the way down, just do go through these individually on your own, but at the very bottom of the list, you'll see easement. 
all easement is, if what I hold is an easement ownership interest in the property, then that's just a come and go. I can't even, that's less than even a possessory interest in the property. All I can do is use it. It's a right of use. Uh, next, slide 22. Um, there is no protection uh, or favorable um, treatment uh, for commercial leases. We do see that at law for uh, residential leases, that laws are set up in such a way to favor a tenant. And the idea is to protect someone from being thrown out and not having a home. But we don't recognize at law that same protection for commercial tenants. So it's described generally in slide 22. Slide 23 describes, and I'm hopping around here, you're going to want to go through these individually on your own, but in slide 23, these are tenant rights. The right of possession, the right of quiet enjoyment. Now, just a quick word on here, on this here. It has nothing to do with volume or noise. Quiet enjoyment is an undisturbed use of the property that you are renting. If you're the tenant, then you are renting. That's what that label or word means, that you are a renter. Um, the landlord can't come and use part of that space that you're renting. That disturbs your quiet enjoyment. It violates a right that you have as a tenant. Um, slide 27, there's a distinction between assignment and subletting. What I want to point out, and what we may have already mentioned in a prior chapter, is that any time, and this is relevant for some students, you sign a lease, uh, in terms of a, a contract you've signed and you are obligated uh, to pay that lease, even if you find someone who's going to sublease and pay your rent, your obligation doesn't change. That technically is a sublease, if, uh, um, but, but what's not perhaps uh, a detail in Chapter 23, but that I want to reiterate for you, is that legal obligation does not disappear just because someone else agrees to sublease uh, the apartment. We talked about zoning already. So the last thing is in slide 23, eminent domain. This is a process that's set out in the Constitution and it allows the federal government to take over land. The federal government, there are two requirements that must be present. The government has to use the property for what's called a public use. So a president or leader could not uh, condemn, which is part of this process, a, a piece of property, claim it for the federal government for their personal use. This has to be a public use. One classic example of the use of eminent domain in our United States history is through the creation of our interstate system, interstate roadways. These are arterial roads that were created that cut and crisscross across our nation. Uh, land had to be taken and used to create those roads. So one Part one, there must be a public use. Part two, the government, the federal government has to pay the fair market value for the property that they take. Uh, and that's the second part of eminent domain. That's it. Good luck.